start a new year every January 1st. I'm so thankful that as we are in a new year, preparing for a new year, there's just something about the calendar that affects our minds and it gets us to thinking a little bit different. And I'm thankful that from that time from Thanksgiving to Christmas and New Year's, when things for us because of the calendar and because of life taking place when things seem to get a little um, out of balance in our life, uh, as we take off one calendar and we put up a new calendar, um, or if you do it on a device, you just you know, swipe to the next one, there's just something in your mind that spurs you to thinking, oh, a new year, and you start to see the commercials on TV that remind us, it's a new year, you need to have a few changes in your life with things that may have become unbalanced. And so we begin thinking about our schedules. We begin thinking about our diet. We begin thinking about spending time with family because the new year is actually that time that we get to have, if you will, a reset button that we get to hit as we launch into the new year. And so our minds begin thinking of those things. In fact, uh, Reader's Digest shared the top 10 resolutions the New Year's resolutions. And some of you may have made some resolutions um, going into the New Year, and probably a majority of you have already broken those resolutions as you've gone into the New Year, but that's okay. According to Reader's Digest, here are the top 10 that are made year after year after year. And Reader's Digest says if we would accomplish those things, we wouldn't have to make them as a resolution going into a New Year. But here they are. The number one... You probably guessed it is to lose weight. Number two, to spend less and save more. Number three, to spend time with family and friends, more time with family and friends. Number four is to get organized. Number five is to learn something new. Number six is to travel more. Number seven is to break the smartphone addiction. Now that one has just crept in, Reader's Digest said, in the last few years. Number eight is to eat at home more. Number nine is to reduce stress. Of course, if you make those first eight, I don't see how you can accomplish number nine in reducing your stress. But number 10 is to get more sleep. And some of you have probably made, I bet if we were to go around and share our resolutions, we could probably mark off all of those. Um, but going into the new year, we are going to... Um, laser focus on one word, and that word is focus. Now, you don't have to adjust your glasses. Uh, this one, word is intentionally out of focus for a reason, because as we go to the end of the year, it seems like things in our life have snowballed sometimes, and we get to that point to where we're at the end of the year, and sometimes we are on the last drop of fuel in our tank and things have begun to snowball and things have begun to snowball and more often than not in our lives we get out of focus and so we are going to focus on our focus for the first several weeks here in 2018 and as we have begun a new year, and as we have launched into 2018, it's my prayer that you each get out that giant reset button and you hit that over and over and over and refocus on the things that God has asked us to focus on. You know, the scripture is clear all throughout the New Testament on where our focus should be and who the object of our focus should be. Andy Stanley, one of my favorite preachers, one of my favorite quotes from him is this, direction, not intention, direction determines our destination. The choices that you make then determines your direction and will eventually lead you to your destination. 
But in order to be in a direction, you have to focus. And your focus is the direction that you've been launched into. The amazing thing is that you get to make the choices. You, every one of us, you get to chart the course. And know this, that it is our decisions, our own decisions, that always trumps our intentions. My grandma used to tell me that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. You see, your choices always trump your intentions. If you make a choice to drive to Beverly Hills, but your intention is to be in Sugar Mill Woods, that's a choice that you made. And you charted your direction. And your intention is then put to death by the choice that you made. And that's why it is extremely important that your focus be in the right place. Because if you miss your focus, you've got some wrong direction in your life. And it's your choice to choose what you focus on. As I've gotten old in my life, I've had to have something help me with my focus. It used to be in 2017 when I came home at night, I could take my glasses off and I could set them on the table and they would stay there and wait for me until the next morning. But now I have to set them on the table because every once in a while I have to grab them to read them, to to read with them. Just last night, I finally hit the point in my life where I had to ask my daughter to read some numbers to me (laughs) because I couldn't read them. You see, my eyes have lost their focus and they need something to help them in their focus. And Jesus addressed all of these things. And we're going to look at the scripture that Jesus has given to us. And it's my hope that over the next several weeks and through our time together here today, that you can begin to focus, if you're not already, on what matters most. And as you move into 2018, you clear away some noise and clutter in your life that will help you focus on the words that God has given to us. Here's what I believe. I believe that when we put our faith in God, that that is when and only when life transformation happens. And until you focus on God... You can make New Year's resolutions for the rest of your life. You can make resolutions every 365 days of the year. But until you begin to focus on God, you will never truly experience life transformation. And the reason that Jesus came and died on the cross, the reason that he was born, is so that we could hone our focus on the things of God. And then, when our focus is correct, Then and only then would we see inside each one of us life transformation. And so we'll focus on some of the most famous words of Jesus Christ. In fact, probably outside of John 3.16, these are the most famous words of Jesus. But I don't want us to go in just a sermon series over the next few weeks. I want it to be a journey with us together as a congregation In fact, we have joined with a total of 14 congregations, and we are beginning 2018 using one word, focus, as our guide. And as a part of that, all of the pastors and some other staff in these churches have put together a journal that through the next 13 weeks, we will journey together through this journal. And I hope that you picked up one of the journals today. If you didn't, there are more in the back of the and in the back of the sanctuary. Grab one of those when you leave. There is a daily reading inside this journal. Uh, On Sunday, there's a place if you choose to put sermon notes or to read the scripture and put some prayer notes inside of that. 
Monday through Friday, there's a daily reading. Saturday is a grace day. If for some reason you didn't uh, do one of the readings during the week, you can go back and make that up or go back and re-reflect on the things and the time that you spent with God. And then on Saturday, there is something called table conversations or table time. And that is a time for our community groups to actually go through those questions together and reflect on the things that God has been dealing with you from Sunday through the time that your community group meets. And so I want to ask you to go on this journey with us. Pick up one of these journals. The church has paid for these journals for you. It doesn't cost you anything. Just pick up one of these journals and go on this journey to focus in 2018 together as a congregation. N.T. Wright is a New Testament scholar, amazing New Testament scholar, and he said this, Prayer is one of life's greatest mysteries. Most people pray at least sometimes. Some people, in many very different traditions, pray a great deal. At its lowest, prayer is shouting into a void on the off chance that there may be someone out there listening. But at its highest, prayer merges into love as the presence of God becomes so real that we pass beyond words and into a sense of his reality, his generosity, his delight, and his grace. For most Christians, most of the time, it takes place somewhere in between those two extremes. To be frank, he says, for many people, it's not just a mystery, but it's a puzzle. They know they ought to do it, but they just aren't quite sure how. And so we are going to focus on the Lord's Prayer. And we are going to focus on the words that Jesus has given to us. But what is prayer? Prayer, indeed, for some of us is a mystery. Prayer is something that some of us haven't quite gotten into just yet. But prayer is simply communicating with God. That's it. Just communicating with a God that longs to communicate with you. That's what prayer is. That's what God desires for each one of us, that we communicate with God. And it's my hope that we are able to find a way to communicate with God for each of us that best fits who we are. So if you'll take a look this morning at Matthew chapter 6, I want to begin reading at verse number 9. These are Jesus' words. If you have a red letter edition, these words are in reds, saying that this is what Jesus spoke as Matthew recorded it. This then is how you should pray. Now, if Jesus is saying, I'm, I'm telling you something, those are important words that follow after that. Some of us have just left these words as something we say at a funeral or something we say at a wedding or something that we say every so often just out of a ritual. But Jesus said, I'm going to tell you how to pray. And if prayer is a mystery, and if prayer is not something that you focus on, Jesus says, this then is how you should do it. He goes on in verse 9. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one. Jesus said, this is your focus. This is how you should do it. If you want to talk to the creator, if you want to talk to the one that loves you, this is the key on how it should be done. And this morning, I want to focus on just the first few words of, chapter, of, of, of Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Jesus said, this is how you do it. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Let those words sink in for just a minute. Our Father in heaven, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Jesus says, this is the key. This is the key to focus. Above all things, above all resolutions, above all things that's going on in your life, this is the key. This is the key focus. Why would Jesus begin this way? 
This is a part of what we would call the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus was giving. And in the Sermon on the Mount, when people had gathered around, Jesus began teaching on a lot of things. They had been asking Jesus questions, and so Jesus had gathered them around to address some of these issues. And it was this prayer that Jesus gave as a part of this teaching series that Jesus was doing. And he was teaching on generosity. He was teaching on moral issues. He was teaching on things we should do or shouldn't be doing or the attitude of our heart. But the central theme in every one of the teachings that Jesus did in the Sermon on the Mount is there is a focus. And that focus must be our Father who art in heaven. Jesus made that the central theme in all of his teachings, not just in the Sermon on the Mount, but in his entire three, three and a half year ministry here on earth. Jesus said, our Father in heaven is the central focus. And as we launch into a new year, if we intend to see life transformation, and I must think that you have some interest in life transformation because you've gathered in a worship service on a Sunday morning. If we are to see life transformation, then our focus must be our Father in heaven. And the reason that Jesus started his prayer that way is because he was saying to those that were gathered around him, this is it, this is the key. This is the central theme. This is what you have to focus on. So your focus in your life in 2018 must be what Jesus was telling those that had gathered around him some 2,000 years ago. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Whatever you're doing, wherever you're going, no matter what's going on in your life, peace or turmoil, mountaintop experiences or valley experiences, your focus must be Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So Jesus begins, this is how you should pray. Not selfish ambition, not for our own material gain, not for our own wants, not for our own needs, but instead our focus should be on our Father. Where is your focus? Where has your focus been? Leading up to January 7th, 2018, where has your focus been? For every one of us, if we were to be honest with ourselves, and as we work through this journal over this next week, we have to come clean with God. And every one of us, me included, we have to say, God, there are times in my life that you're not our focus. You're not my focus. And I am committing right now That from this point forward, forgetting what is behind, but from this point forward, my focus will be on you. And if your focus is correct, if you put on your spiritual glasses to clearly focus on God, then I promise you, I assure you that you will find God all around you, all around you. You just have to have the focus of our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. So why would Jesus begin that way? Why would Jesus begin with our Father? It's two simple words. You can look it up in almost any translation. Almost any translation in the beginning of Jesus' prayer. All of them agree that the beginning is our Father. All of it. Our Father, why would Jesus begin with that? I like that first word there where he says, our, our Father. That reminds me that God, by his choice, is close to me. Not by my choice, by his choice. He chose me. He chose every single one of us, our Father. He's a personal God. 
He wants to be with us. He wants to commune with us. He wants us to spend that time in prayer with him. And so Jesus says, our father, as a reminder to us that he is ours and we are his. He is my God. He is close to me. He is my source. He is my strength, as the psalmist says. He belongs to me. He is my God and he purchased me, paving the way. For me to belong to him. God is my savior. He is our father. Our father. But another thing that I think that Jesus reminds us in that first word, our, is that we are all connected. You see, Jesus didn't say, my father. Jesus didn't pray, my father in heaven. He said, our father in heaven. For all of us. Not just for Jesus, not just for those that had gathered around Jesus on the side of this mountain, but he is our father, meaning that we are all connected. And if you fast forward into Jesus' prayer in John chapter 15, 16, and 17 that we looked at several months ago, Jesus actually prayed for every single one of us, each one of us, that we would be united. And so this prayer... The Lord's Prayer begins reminding us that we are connected. We are all a part of the family of God if He belongs to us and we belong to Him and if our focus is correct. We are united together. There's an old Roman story about an emperor that was in a parade and all of the Romans and all of those that were in the countryside had gathered around to see this emperor and his entourage as they paraded. And uh, some of the warriors had set up um, barriers along the parade route because they knew the emperor would be coming by. And as so often some of those did, they wanted to reach out and just touch the emperor as he passed by. And so the legions, the armies were keeping everybody at bay and, and keeping them off of the pathway that this emperor would be coming by. And they were doing a great job of keeping everybody back. But there was this one little boy who was trying to get through the crowd and he had just stepped out into the road when one of the soldiers picked him up and set him back behind the barricade and said, no, no, you don't understand who that is. That is our emperor. You can't do that, little boy. The man in the chariot is the emperor. And the little boy said, that might be an emperor to you, but I want to tell you that that is my daddy up there in that chariot. You see, that's the relationship that we are able to have with God. And when Jesus begins his prayer by saying, this is how you should pray. And he says, our father, he has given you the right to a title to call God your father. And with that, you become one of his children, a co-heir with Jesus Christ. Our father is not just the beginning to the Lord's prayer. Our Father is a reminder to God's children that He was willing to enter the body of flesh and to offer Himself as a sacrifice on a cruel, rugged cross so that we would have the opportunity to call Him our Father. So where is your focus this year? As we stand right here, right now, on January 27th, or January 7th of 2018, where is your focus? Is it on our Father in heaven? Our Father. I want to tell you a little bit about our Father. Our Father is not just a God that is in heaven that is just there hanging out, biding time until the end of time as we know it here on earth. Our Father is an accessible God that we can come to His throne and spend time communicating with Him in prayer. 
Our Father is an accessible God. He is a God that is close, but not only is He a God that is close to us, He is a God that is inviting us to draw closer to Him. In fact, if we take a look at Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus said, come to me. Jesus said, come to your Father, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take up my yoke and learn from me, because I am lowly and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. You see, some of us have been searching for rest for our souls. But the only way that you will ever find rest for your soul is if you are focusing on our Father. You will never find rest for your, st for your soul in a bookstore. You will never find rest for your soul with somebody else. You will never find rest for your soul with anything here on earth. You will only find rest for your soul when your focus is on our Father. Because our Father, our Father is an accessible Father. Another thing that our Father is, is He's a faithful God. I have found in my own life, some of you have found in your own life, that our God is a faithful God. God will always keep His promises. Always Always will he keep his promises. The writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 10, 23 says, Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, since he who promised is faithful. Our Father is a faithful God. And if God has made a promise, that promise will come to pass. I'm sure that for the centuries of silence before the birth of Jesus Christ, the people began to wonder, has God forgotten about us? We've not heard a word from the prophet. We've not heard anything from God. And there was a promise that God made to his people that he would not only provide for us, but that he would save his people with a Messiah. But our father, our father was a faithful God. And he delivered on that promise, not in the timing of his people, but in his infinite wisdom and in his timing. You may be focusing on a problem that you need God to deal with. You may be focusing on a situation that you need God to step into and take care of. What I'm asking you to do this morning is to move your focus from that problem or that issue and move your focus to our Father, and then the timing isn't going to matter to you anymore. The timing will resolve itself because you're not focusing on that issue. You instead are focusing on our Father who is a faithful God. Another thing about our God Another thing about our Father is He is a just God. He's a just God. But let's be honest. There are some times that we think that it is the wicked that is succeeding in life. Sometimes we feel like we are deprived of justice, and sometimes that motivates us to take justice amongst ourselves. We could go back to what Doug Llewellyn used to always say at the end of the people's court. Don't take justice into your own hands. He should have ended it this way. Instead, take it to our Father. We serve a God that is a just God. And Paul wrote to the Roman church in Romans 12, 17 through 21, Do not repay anyone for evil. Give careful thought to what is honorable in everyone's eyes, if possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Friends, don't avenge yourselves. Instead, leave room for God's wrath, because it is written, vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If your enemy is thirsty, give him something to drink. 
For in doing so, you will be heaping fiery coals on his head. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. Listen, God can be trusted because he is a just God. He will repay evil for evil, and he will repay good for good. And in his wisdom, he will sort things out. Our God is a just God. And just a a, a couple more. Our God is not only just, but he is also a graceful God. He is a graceful God. I like what the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews 4, verse 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Our God is a graceful God. Brennan Manning, in his book titled All is Grace, says these great couple sentences. God loves you unconditionally, as you are not as you should be. This grace is indiscriminate compassion. It works without asking anything of us. It's not cheap. It's free. Grace is enough. He is enough. Jesus is enough. You see, we serve a Father who is a graceful God. And if our focus is on our Father, then grace will abound in our life. We cannot focus on our flesh. We cannot focus on the flesh that is around us. Because our flesh, others' flesh, has no grace in it. Because grace belongs to God and our Father is a graceful God. Another thing that our Father is, He's an outward-focused God. He is an outward-focused God. My greatest prayer for this church is that we would be just as our Father and be an outward-focused church that we would take on the character, we would take on the persona of God in not consuming ourselves with ourselves, but instead we would be so outward focused and meeting the needs of others that we forget about our own needs. You see, and that only comes when our focus is on God. God is constantly, continuously wooing people into his kingdom Constantly drawing more and more and more and more. Outwardly focused on those who are not focused on Him. That too must be our priority in being Christ-like, in being just like our Father. Our Father is an outward focused God. 1 Timothy 2, 1-4 through says, I urge you, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and all those who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good, and it pleases God our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Our God is an outward-focused God, drawing those who are not focused on Him. And God desires to use you to do that. But in order to do that, you have to focus on Him. So I ask you this morning to reflect on Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, when He said, Our Father... Our Father. Who is our Father to you? Who is our Father? 
When you hear Jesus' words saying, this is how you should pray, and he begins with the words, our Father. Ask yourself, who is our Father? Who is our Father to me? That, I believe, is the greatest question that you could ever ask yourself. Who is our Father? And what does He mean to me? Some of you began in your journey with Him and wrestling with prayer. And in that, your focus was in other areas instead of focusing on our Father. Some of you in years past have begun the year thinking, this is my year. This is the year that I'm actually going to stay, to take two steps forward and only one step back instead of the reverse. This is going to be the year that I'm going to succeed. This is going to be the year that I'm going to overcome. And I'm telling you that if those weren't the years for you in the past, 2018 can be that year for you. If your focus is our Father. Maybe you focused on other things. Maybe you focused on the problem. Maybe you focused on issues. Maybe you focused on other people or you focused on your job or, or this, that, or the other. Maybe this morning you just want to say, God, I want to hit that reset button. And this morning... I'm going to shift my focus away from all of those other things, away from all of the noise, away from all of the clutter, away from all of the problems, away from all of the issues in life. And this morning, I'm putting all of those things behind me, and I am going to focus on our Father. Where is your focus? Where is your focus as you begin this year?